Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. My special guest today, among others, is Mr. Ken Stofferin, who is the director of the field staff department of NFO. Ken, exactly what is the function of the field staff department? Well, stating it simply, Bill, our, uh, our function in the NFO is the uh, membership uh, arm of the organization. We're responsible for expanding and getting new members into the organization. Well, now, having talked with uh, some of your field <coughs> personnel in the past uh, two or three weeks, uh, I do know that uh, one of the big jobs that your people have to do is recruiting. Now, you recruit uh, not only from among NFO members, but you also recruit from the colleges across the country, do you not? Yes, we do. We've uh, made it a two-prong effort, and we've gone on to a very aggressive recruiting program uh, from within our nation's colleges and universities, uh, seeking the youth of our country, uh, and as well as within the ranks of our own organization. So we're on a very aggressive recruiting campaign right well, now. Well, you know, <clears throat> you and uh, President Orrin Lee Staley have often told me that uh, you're so proud at NFO to be able to bring back to the farming industry some of the young creative talent across the country. With all of the other businesses and industries needing college graduates, don't you find yourself in a climate of uh, competition for these young people? Uh, they seek opportunities in other walks of life, but. Uh, we found one uh, real significant factor from within the college uh, kids, and that is that a lot of them come from farm backgrounds, but uh, some of them do not. Uh, but that if there is a chance or an opportunity to get back and be of service to agriculture, they want this opportunity, and uh, they find NFO is uh, that kind of a challenge and opportunity for them. Well, now, your recruiting efforts at the college level right now uh, necessitate a great deal of much harder work than in the past because of just an increase in numbers in the field staff. Is that not correct? That's correct. What are you you're increasing the field staff by, well, you're tripling We want the to triple and quadruple yes. of what we presently have. And uh, this, this means a substantial increase over the next uh, few months and years. Now, we all know that people cost money. So when you triple the field staff, certainly you're going to be uh, increasing costs. How will these costs be paid? It's supported uh, solely by uh, the membership uh, dues of the organization. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a pleasure having you stop by long enough to talk about the field staff and to give us this little bit of background, Ken. And now, if you don't mind, I'm going to start introducing to our audience some of these new recruits uh, who will be helping with NFO in the field and perhaps eventually at the national level. For example, Terry Utley. Terry, how long have you worked for NFO now? Well, I started to work for NFO in December of 1967. And off and on while I was in college, I worked on a part-time basis and then in the summer sessions when I could. Now, Terry, uh, as I understand it, your title actually is executive assistant in the field staff department. That's correct. And what are your duties uh, in this particular <clears throat> job? My prime duty is to take the reports from the regional supervisors, and I have approximately 27 that report in to me that have people working under them in the district field representative capacities. Now, there are 27 of them who report in to you. How many people uh, work under them, uh, roughly? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 160. Well, you have here. a lot of people then actually sending you reports day by day, don't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Well, let's look a little bit into your background, Terry, and find out just exactly how and why uh, you arrived on the scene at NFO. Uh, where's your home? My home originally is in the western end of the state of Kentucky, uh -huh. at Hopkinsville, Kentucky. We live about 10 miles south of Hopkinsville, which is about three miles from the Tennessee line. What kind of a farm did you come from? The prime operation we have there would be, we used to raise cattle, but we moved out of that and went in, into hogs and soybeans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in the neighborhood of four, about 400 acres of corn that we have there now, and some tobacco thrown in for good measure. How big a family do you come from, Terry? I have one sister. Well, then you're the only man outside of your father in the family. You might very well say that. And I presume that really, you wanted to stay in some aspect of agriculture, didn't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. 
I would rather farm than do any other occupation that I know of. But as the, the present situation, the present economic situation, it is not only economically unsound, but it is almost senseless yes. for youth and people such as myself to remain on the farm. You did now uh, go on to college. That Where is right. did you attend college? I went to the University of Kentucky and to Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green. And what were your majors? I started out in political science, but I moved into agricultural economics and then basically economics and history. Mm -hmm. And these were the, my prime fields of study. Well, now how did you get to NFO? <clears throat> it's kind of interesting how it all started. It started one night when I came in from the University of Kentucky. And my dad came in from a meeting down in southern Tennessee somewhere, and he came in about 2 o'clock in the morning, and he said, are you interested in working for NFO? He woke me up, and I said, yes. And he said, well, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I want you to be in Nashville, Tennessee. So the next morning I, at 8 o'clock, I was in Nashville, and I went through a two-day rather intensive training school with Mr. Tom Norman. And immediately following that, I went on the road in western Kentucky and have been working ever since. And when did you arrive at uh, National Headquarters in Corning. I have been here at the National Office since about the middle of January. Mm -hmm. You enjoying it? Certainly am, but it's uh, rather interesting in the fact that of the caliber of people we have here at the National Office and of the caliber of work that is performed here in Corning. Now, <clears throat> how much college did you actually finish? All right, I have three and a half years of actual college. Three and a half years? That is right. How many hours credit hours do you think it would require for you to get your degree? It would take somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to 24. I've never figured <clears throat> well, out Well, you're talking now about maybe a very heavy semester or two light semesters, right. a light school year, right. to go ahead and get your degree. How do you feel about finishing? Well, there's coming a day when I'm very well sure that I will finish. But under the present situation, the present economic situation that agriculture is facing, I think it is very important that I continue the job of working for NFO because I think that 12 o'clock is almost here for agriculture today and that we have to work fast if we're going to save the family farm and private enterprise system. So you want to do first things first. Absolutely. Save the farm, save agriculture, and then maybe you'll have a little time to finish up that degree. Absolutely. My sentiments completely. Well, now you have uh, been on the scene at NFO long enough to make some comments, I'm sure, about the bringing into the organization young, capable people uh, with agricultural backgrounds. What do you think of these people generally you see coming in and joining? Some of the highest caliber people I find in our statement, progressive farmers are joining NFO, is probably one of the most truthful statements we have ever had within the NFO. We have had many, many people joining NFO, of course, here recently, younger people, people Larger farmers, it seems to be a higher caliber of personnel joining NFO and working for NFO. A very definite trend toward the complete leaders of agriculture. Terry, may I just compliment you in this manner to close. If you typify the kind of lung, young leadership coming to NFO, I have greater hopes for the organization than I ever have before. And I mean that sincerely. Well, thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate the compliment. My next guest today is Larry Yaw, who comes from Terre Haute, Indiana. Larry, I guess everybody has heard of your home territory, Terre Haute, Indiana. What does the name Terre Haute mean? Well, they give it the name, the hot spot of uh, the Midwest, uh, Sin City. But uh, I think Indianapolis is always sort of plugging away at us yeah. on that point because uh, that's where all the uh, bad rumors come from. <laughs> Well, now, Terre Haute translates what, I, uh, literally? It means high ground. High ground. Is, is, is it high ground in your area? Well, it's supposed to be the highest point in the Wabash Valley. It's set along the uh, Wabash River there. Uh -huh. Now, Larry, you uh, indeed uh, have a farm background, do you not? Yes, I come from the rural area, a small farm that my folks used to own. How big a farm did you grow up on? It was 60 acres. Well, now, in terms of today's farming, that one is a little one, isn't it? Yes, it is, quite yes. little. Well, where did you go to school? Uh, I went to a small county school in Blackhawk, Indiana, which is in the southern part of Eagle County. And uh, I enjoyed going to that school. It's no longer in existence. It's consolidated now. Like everything, I guess they have to put together things to make a, a better school. Right. 
did you, uh, you say you enjoyed going to the smaller school by comparison, for example, with perhaps attending high school at Terre Haute. Why did you enjoy the smaller school, Larry? Well, uh, there I was able to uh, participate in sports, and uh, if I'd went to a larger school, I probably wouldn't even made the team. Well, now, what kind of sports did you participate in? You're kind of a small fellow. Right, I uh, played basketball. Did you? Uh, right. And By golly, uh, it proves, I guess, that height still doesn't rule the game because you're uh, you're how tall? Five four. Five four. Yes, I played a guard spot. Mm -hmm. Well, I would presume that uh, actually, if you were in uh, the bigger school, uh, like Terre Haute, that uh, you might not have made the team. Well, this is true. Then. Yeah. Well. You didn't go directly from high school to college, did you? No. Tell us about that. Well, I went into a two-year training period to become an x-ray technician. And after completing that, I was certified by the AMA and was a registered radiological technician. And I've worked at that job ever since. And uh, after about four years out of school, uh, I decided that this wasn't enough education, so I enrolled at Indiana State University, uh, Terre Haute, Indiana. And, and this is where you uh, took your degree. Right. You, in other words, sustained yourself through your college four years by uh, working as a, uh, an x-ray technician. Right. right. What sort of hours did you work, and uh, how did you work this in with your class schedule? Well, I, I was always on the uh, night shift or evening shift at the hospital, which was from 2 to 11 in the evening and always had to schedule my courses in the morning or early in the afternoon so that I could still still maintain my job at the hospital. They used to get a little upset once in a while when I was late, but uh, after they saw that I was going to go ahead and finish college, they were kind of for me then. Of course they were. How early were some of your classes uh, in the morning? Well, in regular session, I used to have some 8 o'clock classes. So you'd get off work at the hospital at 11, after we're having been there nine hours, and then uh, you'd have to get up and make an eight o'clock class the next morning at times. Right. Well, I think you worked hard to achieve your education, and you're to be commended for it. Thank you. Now, let me ask you about this matter of recruitment. Uh, we hear a great deal about recruitment of college graduates. Of course, the National Farmers Organization is very active in recruiting among the colleges all across the country. Tell me how recruiting works at your school. Well, the uh, university there has their uh, college placement bureau, which is operated by the, by the university itself, and companies seeking uh, students to interview will come to the placement bureau and, and tell the placement bureau that they are going to be there on a certain day to uh, interview prospective employees. And uh, in turn, the, uh, the placement bureau has a mailing list, and they mail out the mailing list to the, the graduate students and, and seniors. And you can run down the list, and if you're interested in this particular company, you mm -hmm. go and sign up, uh, try to get a, a sign-up date or mm -hmm. the hour that you're going to sign up. Well, in other words, the graduate actually chooses the industry in which he finds an interest rather than the industry coming to certain students. Yes, yes. Okay, now in your case, Larry, how many uh, interviews did you have? I conducted, I think, 12 or 13. I, I kind of lost Among count. them was an interview with NFO. Right. And as it turns out, NFO won, or you won, <laughs> or maybe both won. Perhaps that's the ideal situation. Yes. Why did you choose NFO? Well, uh, for one, I've always had an interest in, in farming and been a sympathizer for the, for the farmer because of coming from the farm. And my ambition would be to farm, but uh, this is probably out of the question in this day and age, so I thought that with not being able to farm, I could at least work with the farmers in trying to help their situation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it speaks well for NFO that a young man with your background and education uh, chose NFO in competition with, uh, we'll say, 11 or 12 other industries. And I hope that you'll be happy in uh, the field you've chosen. Well, how do you feel about your indoctrination here? 
Well, I think college was a picnic compared to this. <laughs> it's pretty tough. Right. Would you call it a, a crash program? Well, I would call it that, really. And you have to learn about the various procedures and the, and the agreement. Mm -hmm. And I never saw it before I got here, so yes. you have to learn it pretty quick. Well, you have to, I guess, uh, take a week's time and cram home a great deal of information that uh, you will find necessary in your field work in the future. I just hope that uh, you and uh, your associates in this new group of college men joining NFO will be able to uh, retain it. That's the important thing, yeah, isn't this, it? Yeah, this is true. Well, Larry, uh, will you go back to Indiana to work uh, as a member of the field staff? I plan to. Was this, uh, incidentally, a factor in your choosing NFO? Well, it was a good point because um, most of the companies I've interviewed, they wanted to send me to Detroit and Philadelphia and all over the country, which I didn't particularly want to move out of the area I live in. And I think it's only wise on the part of NFO that they would send somebody like you back home to work because it's obvious that you must have a lot of contacts there and you must know the territory, so to speak. Well, I hope I know the territory, let's put it that way. Larry, it's been a pleasure having you on U.S. Farm Report and uh, may I wish you well in this new undertaking. Thank you. Now I would like for you to meet John Bostick of Water Valley, Kentucky. John, what part of Kentucky is Water Valley in? Water Valley is the, in the western most part of Kentucky, just a little bit east of the Mississippi River and just a little bit north of Tennessee, right now, in the corner. You do have a farm background. You were raised on the farm, weren't you? Yes, I was. I, I've been raised, I was raised on the farm all my life, and I'm interested in what the farm has for me. How big a family do you come from, John? I have a sister. My mother and father is four. Mm -hmm. Now, is your dad a member of NFO? Yes, he is. He's been a member since 1967. How big a farm do you have? Well, how big is the home place and the, what kind of farming do you do there? Well, our home place is approximately 160 acres, but we rent an additional 450. Mm -hmm. And our primary cash crop is soybeans, and then we raise hogs to supplement that. What college are you attending? I go to school at Murray State University. Murray State. Now, where is that? That is in Murray, Kentucky. Murray, Kentucky. And uh, what is your actual major, John? I am majoring in agricultural business. Mm -hmm. Well, what actually attracted you to NFO? Did you come to NFO as a new member of the field staff department uh, as a result of something you might have learned in your background from your father about the organization, or did you get your knowledge about NFO otherwise? Well, I think it goes back uh, further than that even. I, I was raised on the farm, and I've been familiar with what the farmer has had to deal with mm -hmm. over a period of time. And plus, my education in college made me aware of how these things are changed and how they're brought about. And the farmer is caught in the price squeeze between increased prices on what he has to buy to produce and a lesser price that goes down or stays the same for what he sells. And I don't think this is right. There should be a stabilization in, in this area in some way. Mm -hmm. Well, then I infer from your attitude and from what you say that uh, this is almost uh, a, a cause to you, a challenge and a cause, because you believe so strongly in, in what NFO is attempting to do to get the farmer a better price, a fair price for his commodities. Yes, it is a challenge and it is a cause. It has never been accomplished before and has never been attempted to the scale that we are doing it now or to the success that we are doing. And I believe it's, there's a great challenge in this field to bring about this stabilization of price for the farmer so that he can expect decent buying power like labor and industry. Mm -hmm. And this is my cause that I am I'm fighting and working for. Now, during the few days you have been at national headquarters of NFO and Corning in the indoctrination course, uh, what have you learned? Well, to tell you what I have learned would take a lot longer than <laughs> I think we have here. Uh, it's a real comprehensive course that they've given us in, in marketing and collective bargaining and how and what the farmer should do 
to better increase his price and to make his income more stable and compete with the other industries. This is what they are, are teaching us, not only exactly how to do it, but how to let the farmer know how to do it. It's our job to go out and tell them and help them. What kind of a routine have you had at Corning? I mean, have you had long days that extend into night? Yes, definitely. Our uh, routine starts about 8 o'clock in the morning and ends sometime as late as 9.30 or quarter to 10 at night. And this is with just a few short breaks for lunch and supper. I presume that uh, even though you have spent, as you have just said, very long days, that you are aware that the people here at the national level of NFO spend this kind of a day as a routine thing, you know? I've noticed this. There are people that work when I come in and there are people that work when I leave. They just don't uh, work by the hour, you see. One man I talked to, uh, I went in his office, he works in the field staff department here, and he pointed to his clock on the wall and it was broken, it was not running. And he said, well, since my clock broke, I just don't know when to quit working, so I'll work all day. John, I want to wish you a great deal of good luck in uh, this career that you have chosen for yourself. Are you going to, to go back now to Kentucky to work uh, as a member of the field staff? Yes, I am. Going actually to the home territory. That's right. I am, I am still in college, and I'm going to supplement my college with work in this field. How much uh, school do you have yet to accomplish for a degree? Approximately two years. Two more years. But I don't, I don't think I can wait long enough till I get a degree before I start work. I believe we should start work today, now. John, thank you very much for being my guest on U.S. Farm Report. Thank you. My next guest is George Ponder of Fayetteville, Arkansas. George, you know, usually you hear about people from the Midwest, for example, or for that matter, from all parts of the country, of uh, being transplanted to California, but you've done just the opposite in your lifetime, haven't you? You started out as a Californian, and where did you come from California? Alhambra, California. And uh, to what part of the country did you, did you move? Northwest Arkansas, Fayetteville. Did you go through uh, elementary and high school in California? Yes, I did. Uh, did you go to the University of Arkansas? Yes, that's cor correct. Uh, how much college have you actually had in terms of hours? Oh, a little over a hundred. Exactly how many, I'd have to get out my transcript and check. How did you, as an urban dweller, George, get all of this interest in agriculture? Well, as I said, when we moved back to Arkansas, Arkansas is a tremendous poultry area. Mm -hmm. We'd li I live in a community with poultry growers, and I associated with them. I became acquainted with their problems. Going to school, I've talked with other people from other areas, and I was approached and come, was informed about the NFO mm -hmm. and what they were doing, and I decided that this is an organization that is growing and is going to do something so that the farmer will quit competing against himself, and this is something he's done ever since he started raising grain or anything. Well, I think that uh, you're right, and I think that uh, the NFO is undoubtedly the only farm organization that uh, is interested basically in one thing, and that is to get the farmer a fair price for his commodities, to take him out of the category of being a beggar at the marketplace and giving him an opportunity to price his commodities fairly and to get fair money for what he raises. That's correct. That's very correct. Be able for the far farmer to take his place in the economy of the nation. Now, you're going out as a member of the field staff of NFO. Are you going to work in Arkansas? This I'm not positive of. I think so, but I do not know. You don't know at this time where you're going to go? That's correct. Well, uh, you've been here at uh, Corning, Iowa, at National Headquarters, in an indoctrination program. Uh, how many days have you been here so far? Three days. Well, what do you think of it? Very impressive. It's an effective organization, and it looks efficient. I'll have to go into it further before I can make up a complete opinion. Now, 
You intend, I guess, someday to pursue your education and achieve your degree. That's true. And uh, perhaps uh, you can do so uh, while you work. Yes, this is possible through correspondence courses and extension courses. Yes. This is quite possible. This is something I have in mind. I talked to one of the other fellows earlier on uh, today's show, George, about what the young man is looking for today in a career. Uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, statistics prove, as a result of interviews, that young men are looking for such things as uh, security, uh, status, uh, money, of course, uh, is there something more that perhaps you're looking for than these, uh, these factors? Well, those factors are very important, but there's something else, too. I want to be, leave something that I can say that I've done my part in a, creating a better society. This may sound like something old-fashioned or dug up out of a book, but it's true. Well, may I just interrupt you, and I want you to pursue, but may I interrupt to say that it is old-fashioned, what you're saying, because we don't hear enough of this in, in the, this time in our lives. And it's refreshing and very good to hear this coming from you, so go ahead with it. Well, I believe that, that might sum it up. If a person can do something that he's happy in doing and achieve goals for himself and his family and do it so that all can benefit from it, I think he could chalk up his life as a success. Thank you very much, George, for being a guest on U.S. Farm Report. And may I extend our best wishes to you for a most happy time with NFO. My special guests on U.S. Farm Report have been Ken Stofferin, the director of the field staff of NFO, and four young college men recently assigned to the field staff. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.